welcome ladies and gentlemen to Global Project Management Forum, day zero. Uh, very happy, very proud, يعني بنقول in Arabic كبرت وقلبنا زي ما يقولوا, by attending Saturday afternoon. Uh, sorry for the unintended delay now. I'd like to introduce Lee Lambert. Lee Lambert is truly the father of project management. He's the guy who made the PMP, okay? Has like 55 years of experience, 40 something with PMI. So a lot of knowledge and wisdom for all of us to really benefit and enjoy listening to Lee. Now Lee's gonna start, before we start his, his, uh, his, 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 his slide, okay? Uh, he has eight slides, all cartoons, the way I like it, <laughs> okay? But it's about the man. So, welcome, Lee. Thank you, thank okay. you very much. Yep. Welcome, Lee. All right, I, I learned, uh, I used to be a sports writer in the East Bay area, and I learned, uh, I had a, a big banquet to raise money for a young child that had drowned and was on life support. And my keynote speaker was George Foreman. I'm sure you've heard of George Foreman. He was training in my city at the time for his uh, next uh, Muhammad Ali fight. And he came in, we had about 400 people there. He was an hour late, an hour late, okay? I'm 10 minutes, come on, are you kidding me? He was an hour late, and when he got there, he said he was told long ago, if you get to be important, you should always be late, okay? So I thought, well, what the heck, I'll try it and see how it works. And it did, look at this, you got a full house, that's awesome. Uh, no, I'm, uh, I'm really looking forward to this. I, the first two or three presentations, uh, they really pretty much stole all my material. So I don't know what I'm going to say, but uh, I'll figure something out. I got some slides, and uh, they're going to be working on that any minute now. Uh, but this is about tools, okay, the, the project management tools. Now, everybody in here that has anything to do with project management knows that project management is everything. I mean, you can talk about the strategy and the big data and all that, but without project management, they got nothing. They got nothing, there's nothing to work with. Big data got no data if we don't give it to them from project management. So the tools that let us be more effective at what we do uh, are really the key to how it works. Now I wanna tell you, based on my experience, and again, it's long, I mean, for 55 years, I started when I was seven, uh, working in project management, uh, and uh, the experience that I've had says basically, uh, nobody's really using them. No, we talk about them a lot. We, I mean, I used to make a lot of money talking about tools. Nobody ever used them. Uh, but they liked what we said, and they said well, it would be a good idea if we had that. I said, we do. And they said, oh, well, I didn't know that. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a little story while they're getting me set up here about Microsoft. Anybody here represent Microsoft or have Microsoft in their toolkit? <laughs> Microsoft would be happy to see this. All right, so let me tell you why you don't have them, because most of you don't have them, okay? So uh, this, is, this is one of the areas that I, I've always worried about with tools. If they, if they don't get used, I want to know why, because maybe we can fix that. You know, Maybe we can make it so they can. I happen to think that the critical path methodology, the integrated logic network diagram, is probably the most important tool that project managers have, to be honest with you. And so uh, <clears throat> I got a call about, it's been about eight years ago now, from a, from a guy named T uh, Tony Scott. Uh, and when I got the call, uh, I answered the phone and I didn't recognize the voice. And so I asked who it was and he said, well, this is Tony Scott calling. <laughs> and I said, who's Tony Scott? And he said, oh, I'm the CIO of Microsoft. Oh, I said, yeah, what can I do for you, Tony? Uh, and he said, well, uh, we want you to come out to Redmond and uh, lead us in a sort of a kickoff meeting for a new methodology we're using at Microsoft Project. We, we've heard rumors, this is what he said, we've heard rumors that our projects don't come in on time. <laughs> I said, it ain't a rumor, Tony. That's true. Your projects suck. 
And so I said, uh, uh, what do you want me to do, a training program or what? And he said, no, no, not training, not training. We asked people about what your strength was, and they said, well, just kind of getting people enthusiastic and excited about the possibilities associated with project management, you know, kind of the stuff that says you don't have to do any work. And so uh, he sa I said, well, how many people are we going to talk about here? He said, we're bringing in 300 of Microsoft's finest project managers from around the world uh, to give them that, an introduction to this new methodology that we're going to try. And I said, wow, 300, that's, that's a lot, isn't it? And he, he, he said, yeah, that really is, and they're our, they're our finest. They're as good as it gets. And, and I said to him, uh, well, you know, uh, Tony, I said, I think I'm going to turn it down. I think I'm going to pass on this. He said, what? Pass on an opportunity like this with Microsoft? He said, well, why would you do that? And I said, well, I'll tell you what. That you got 300 of the finest Microsoft people, which control 72% of the market share at that time, okay? And, and these, are the, these are the guys that kind of make it happen. I said, I'll tell you the truth, I'm a little intimidated. I said, I'm not sure I want to expose myself to that kind of criticism from 300 of the finest. So I'm, I'm going to pass on this one. And then he mentioned the money, and I said, well, we should talk a little longer about it. Uh, and we did, and we came to an agreement that I was going to do that for him, okay? So time comes around. I go into the T Seattle uh, SeaTac Airport. They pick me up in a limo. That didn't happen that often. Picked me up in a limo, drove me over to Redmond. Uh, and, and it was kind of like here. I got there like in the morning and had to go on the stage. Sort of here, at least I had a few hours. And uh, so I got there, and I go into the room, and sure enough, there, it's a packed house, about 300 people, Microsoft people. And, uh, and so I had to listen to about an hour of the, of the improvement team for the latest version, which at that time was 10, 10.0. 10, 10 uh, and I had to listen to that, which, I mean, I, it was not that good, but I had to listen to that. Uh, and so they, then they exited stage right, okay? So now, uh, <clears throat> now it's my turn. Uh, and I said, told Tony, don't, don't introduce me. Let me introduce myself. I said that people, most people know my name. And I said, Here's, let me tell you why I'm here. I said, I'm here to lead, uh, what's this? Oh, is this a hearing aid? What is it? No. <laughs> oh, oh, all right, I'll get to that. That's my first slide, but this one. So I, I, I said, uh, here's why I'm here. I'm here to uh, kick off this new methodology that Tony Scott's putting in place uh, and get you to understand the potential behind it, the, the benefits that can provide for you as project managers. And I said, since you're the 300 of the finest in the company, uh, I think you'll be excited to hear about this. And so I said, so that's what I want to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to basically, uh, it's kind of like a, a pep rally. That's what it is, it's a pep rally. I'm going to lead in a pep rally to get you excited. And some of you in your schools that had athletic programs or maybe academic programs for that matter, cheerleaders come out, rah, rah, get you all fired up. You run out on the field, just get the snot knocked out of you on the field, okay? Uh, so yeah, it's, a, it's a pep rally with no talent. But I said, no, not, not this, this group's a pep rally with talent. 300 of the best. And I said, so uh, I, I'm looking forward to it. I said, so I gotta collect a little data before I start. I said, uh, out of the 300, and I don't have any of these fancy Slido things where you don't do it all, that. this is just a raise of hand. Uh, when, I, when I said, okay, how many of you in this room, 300 some, how many uh, use Microsoft Project right now? Raise your hand, oh, you raise your hand. No, ra okay, so look at that. Well, that's good, seven or eight. Uh, okay, so we got Microsoft, all right, so then, uh, that really stunned me. Now, out of that group of 300, they, had, they beat you guys, uh, they had 39. 39 out of 300. Well, at that point in the presentation, Tony Scott, who had been sitting next to me, got up and left the room. And he, he wasn't smiling when he left. This was not good news for him, okay? Not good news for him. Only that many people has also used my product at 70% market share, Are you kidding me? Uh, so I, he went and as he, as he closed that door, I said, good, now we can talk. I said, now we can talk. He's out of the room. I said, if you're, if you're, you, you gotta be the finest, you're here, you've come from all over the world, you're not using Microsoft, uh, could I ask uh, why? Would it, would it be okay to ask why you're not using the product that you work for? Uh, and it was 
quiet, but very much like this. Very, very quiet. And finally, a, a lady in the back of the room said, well, let me tell I'll tell you, Mr. Lambert. She said, I'm, she said, I'm, not, I'm not afraid of you. I'll tell you. She said, the reason I don't use it is too darn complicated. It's too complex to use. And I thought, wow, that's crazy. I said, how many of you have the same thing? More than half of the pans went up. Too complicated, OK? I said, OK, so you, but you're still the finest, so what? That means you must get projects done on time. So what are you using to manage your projects? What do you think they said? Just think about it. Well, what are you using? Excel spreadsheet. That's what they're using, Excel spreadsheet. Tony Scott, who had left the room, he heard about this. And uh, I understand he put out a memo the next day that said, if I catch anybody using an Excel spreadsheet to manage their projects, it'll be the last project you manage here. So now they were really upset because now they're going to put them in their drawer so they can keep their drawer closed. Uh, but to, so, they, so it looked to me like, well, that's crazy. That, that, that's crazy. That product uh, is, is not that complicated. Now, I've never intended to, nor do I ever want to be, uh, an expert in using Microsoft Project, OK? If I wanted to be, I could, but I don't. Uh, and so, uh, I, but I do find out, and I do believe, that that tool is, is good for 90% of the projects. I mean, when you're talking $100 billion thing, like, that was so, I thought that was like imaginary, $100 billion. And then I learned there were four or $500 billion projects going on. I'm thinking, damn, that, that's out of Microsoft's league. Uh, but if for smaller projects, you know, down to, say, $2 billion or $5 billion, small stuff, like my salary for a week, uh, if you get something like that, maybe Microsoft's good. So I wanted to make sure that we could do that. And... Uh, and sure enough, they, they did uh, start using it to, to some extent. It's still a very low percentage of the people that are supposedly the best that Microsoft has uh, use it. And, and the reason they use it is they think it's too complicated and too complex. And so they use Excel spreadsheets, which can basically do none of the stuff we talked about this morning. I mean, it's a cute little thing, Excel spreadsheet, but it doesn't do the things that we need it to do. So when, we get, uh, when I get started with this actual presentation, you'll begin to see why I'm a, I'm a zealot when it comes to the tools. Because as I, especially as I listen to John, Jan today about this big data thing, uh, I've been a proponent for I don't know how long uh, of why can't we predict the future when we have all this project management data. Well, I don't, I don't understand. And why do we continue to make the same mistakes over and over again? When if we ran the big data, we could see that no, we don't do that anymore. That's not been working out for us. So as I go through this, stop me whenever you want. If you have a question, this is a good point for you to understand. If you have a question, I don't care. What, I, I do not care what the question is. I, I'm serious. I don't care what the question is. Ask it. Okay? My feeling is this. If you're asking the question, you don't know the answer, so anything I say will sound really good. Okay? <laughs> so don't forget, just ask me the question. Now, I've been around long enough, there's probably not a lot of questions you can answer. Ask me, but we'll give it a try. So let's see. I don't really need this thing. To tell you the uh, here, let's look at it this way. Here, here's the, this is my intro slide. Okay? And the point I'm trying to make with this slide is that instead of managing projects, we're inventing more tools. We, we, if we have a bad project, so hell, we need another tool for that. We need another tool. Pretty soon you got so many tools, you don't use any of them, okay? You spend a lot of money, you got a lot of people that can, uh, can turn it on and turn it off, but when it comes to using it, I, I just don't see it. Now what I've tried to do, and I think Jan mentioned this, or maybe it's Dr. Saudi, I, don't, I forget, one of these geniuses that were on earlier in the day, said something about, you know, at the end of the day, it's all really just about common sense. Now, you notice I've left that out of the box? That's because nobody uses it. Nobody uses common sense. And so we've got all these tools, and you look at them, I'll pick out a couple that I'm going to talk about. 
critical path schedules. I'm gonna. I'm just getting ready to do a presentation for a big pharmaceutical conference out in San Francisco and London, and the presentation is uh, your critical path goes through Starbucks, <laughs> and we're gonna be able to have some fun with that. They they don't normally have people like me at their conference, but they let me come to Philly last couple of months ago, and now they want me to come again. So I'm gonna have some fun with that. So we got that, we got, I'm not gonna talk about PERT, you know what that is, Program Evaluation Review Technique, three point estimates, out of, yeah, that whole thing. So I'm not gonna do that, I've never seen a project done that in my life, so, but it's pretty interesting <laughs> stuff. Uh, I'm gonna do trends, trends are important, you know, but I have a rule about uh, kind of the historical data. Uh, this rule says that anything that's happened in the past, anything that's happened in the past, will continue to happen in the future unless someone does something about it. And we're the someone. The project managers are the someone. Hi. How do they do? Back and back and back. Henry? Okay. I'll do it. I'll do it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, not that much? Oh. So, <laughs> so, so I, I, uh, I do believe in the trend analysis. I think it's important to do. Let's talk about that. Earned value, I've made a big amount of money off a of earned value book that I wrote that's so simplistic I'm almost embarrassed. I do cash the checks, but I'm embarrassed to cash them uh, because it's so simplistic. Uh, but I'm gonna look at a lot of these kinds of tools. Now there's, <clears throat> there's two of the most important tools. Oh, that'll be much better. I need both of my hands to talk. Which tool do you use now? Uh, okay. How's that? Can you hear? Oh, now we're talking. That's lovely. <laughs> All right, now we're talking. Okay, now I'm going to start over because I didn't. Uh, <laughs> All right, let's let's look at these now. There's two. There's two project management tools uh, that are paramount to success. If you don't have these two tools, I would be willing to wager you'll never be successful in project management. Does anyone want to take a guess at what they are? There's two of them. No, there's two. No, no not in the box. Not in the box. What now? Huh? Oh, you want to see me? Oh, God. <sighs> okay, so they take away my tools. Now they've taken away my style. So what are you going to do? Just stand here like this? No. All right. Okay, let me tell you what they are. No, because some of you are just dying to find out. Uh, first of all, and they've all been mentioned, well, no, only one has been mentioned today, uh, the charter. You remember, remember, you heard about the charter? What, what does the charter do? It officially authorizes your project, and, and the beauty of the charter, I think, if I'm basing a, just say a little million dollar, no, let's say 10 million, a little $10 million job, you get a two-page charter. And you're supposed to build a plan from a two-page charter, okay? So here's what I want to tell you, and I think, it, I think all the stuff we've been talking about, about strategic alignment and all that, I think that's great. And I think that when we get a charter for a new project, we ought to know that we ought to start asking some strategic alignment questions. How does this project fit in with what we're doing in our organization? Where does it fit in our ability to get our uh, objectives achieved, okay? Now, why is that important information? Where it fits tells you what? How important it is. How important it is. And when, when you know how important it is, what does that give you in the way of information? It gives you leverage. If you're working on a project that's number one on the hit parade and you need some resources, I gotta tell you what, you're gonna get them. If yours is number 25, you're gonna be begging for them just like everybody else does. So you need to know that. You need to ask questions. This is something senior management does not like. 
I think you covered it very nicely. They do not like it because you're questioning their authority. What do you mean you have a question? It's all in the charter. No, it's not. It's not even close to all in the charter. So you can have that conversation. Now you can have it uh, passively, or in my case, you could have it aggressively. That's why I work so many places. So you gotta, you gotta realize that you've gotta ask those questions because you don't wanna start project planning until you're understood that you've aligned with the strategy. Because otherwise, you're gonna be left out, hanging out with nothing to support your project. Okay, so that, we don't spend near enough time on that. Now the, the PMI uh, PMBOK, even the new PMBOK, uh, talks about the charter. It's a very important document. They don't do a good job at all talking about what the charter really is and what it really contains in the way of information. Uh, so I'm here to tell you that. And when you're done, if you had a two-page charter, and if it's not six or eight or nine pages, by the time you're done getting all the questions answered, you're heading for trouble. It's as simple as that. Remember that everything about the project is based on the charter. E everything. So you got a $10 million project, you got a two-page charter, pretty sure you don't have it all yet. And so you want to take time, invest time, to ask questions. What you want to do is, and this is what I did, early on is that you want to create the illusion that you're intelligent by asking questions, by asking deep penetrating questions. And that's what you want to do so that when you're done with the charter, you feel comfortable that you've really defined that project well, okay? So it's gonna mean talking about strategic people, it's gonna be talking about other resource uh, alignment, other uh, line managers, functional managers. You're gonna to have to talk to people to be able to do that. So that's the charter, that's number one. That, that's, that's the easier of most of them, to tell you the truth. Uh, what's the second one that was not mentioned today, and that's really evidence of how poorly designed that structure was this morning? It didn't mention this important document? Goodness sakes. What is it? What is it? Don't be shy. No. No, I'm not going to read. Oh, that's okay. Uh, here. Oh, oh. Go out get it out of the camera. Oh, whoa, don't want to do that. That was close. Uh, okay. What is it? Uh, it's close. It's, here, here, it's... Oh, well, now everybody's guessing. Okay, let's hear some more. What else? A scope. That's a beautiful thing. A scope statement, yeah, that's good, but not what I'm looking for. Now, let me try this. I'm, trying, I'm going to try an acronym on you see if you get it. WBS. What, what is it? Work breakdown structure. See, now that's the first time I've heard it right. Every time I do this, they say BS stands for something different than breakdown structure. So I'm glad to hear that. I think, I think the WBS is where it all comes together. Uh, and I'll, I'll kind of, I'm going to gather some data from, from the audience, if you can see it. I wish we had some bigger markers. Am I complaining too much? All right. Now, can you see that? Yeah. <laughs> see if you can find me a black one, would you, please? Okay, here's, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to... I'm going to put up one. Uh, somebody define the WBS for me out of the pen box. You know, how many are PMPs? I guess I didn't even ask that. How many PMPs? Oh, thank you. Raise your hand. What the heck's wrong with the rest of you people? <laughs> what the? Do you realize that PMP is the key to future? Yes. If you're, if you're a project manager without a PMP, you're dirt. No, I'm just kidding. But, but you really ought to try to get it. I mean, it's a, it's a cool thing to have. Uh, I got a Greg Biggs beautiful certificate when I did it. Of course, it, mine was free. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you, you, uh, one of the things we really focus on in the PMBOK, not, not as much in the seven, but in the six, uh, is this idea of work breakdown structure. So let me, let me remember, so that you understand, it's taking the hierarchical decomposition of the work scope down to the lowest level, okay? Lowest meaning a decision that you make because the lowest level is the level you want to manage at, okay? So that level will vary person to person, but it takes it down to that level where that's where you're going to measure performance. 
And one of the things we have a hard time understanding in today's environment is why we do planning. So many people, oh, why do I have to spend so much time planning? Well, how are you going to measure progress if you don't have anything to measure it against? Okay? So we have to have a plan. And all the quality of big data, all the quality of any of the things that we've talked about earlier in the morning, rely upon a plan. So when we talk about retrospectives, that's an agile term, when we talk about learning process, we have to be bouncing that off of a good plan to know it represents anything. If it's not a good plan, it's not really usable. So when I talk about AI, artificial intelligence, that's a big, you know, that's a big deal now. Uh, I say AI should produce AI. And the second AI is actionable information. When I use AI to generate future, that provides actionable information. I built my reputation at General Electric, and one of the reasons I'm where I am today on being able to predict the future of projects up to a year to two years in advance. Management loved me. They loved me. I saved them so much money. Uh, and I did that by, by real, I mean, we didn't have any of this magic stuff you all have now. Uh, I just took the old data, manipulated it a little bit, and I guess I did an algorithm. I didn't know it, but, it was but then I forecasted the future. And sure enough, my, my saying, what well, happened past that happened in the future, it was true. And so you have an opportunity that I never had because you've got good data now. If you plan well, you've got good data that can be manipulated quickly and accurately. Uh, so you've got some huge advantages over what, what I had. I, when I first started out, I don't know about you, but when I first started out, we had tools, don't get me wrong. Uh, my tool that I used more than, more, almost more than anything else was... Uh, it was uh, uh, paper and pencil. That, that's what my tool was. So it was a lot of hand manipulation, a lot of hand calculation, but it came out right, and it saved a lot of money, and it created a big job for me. So I want you to understand that, that without the work breakdown structure, okay, and here, here, here's one of the elements. This is a this is a 0001, okay, so we've done at a pretty, pretty deep level. Now, when I get down to that level, that work package is going to have a specific scope associated with it, okay? So, in other words, now we know, we know what the deliverable is, right? We know what the deliverable is because that's how we've identified that work package. Now, let's talk about what else goes associated with that work breakdown structure element. What else do I need to put in here? Resources. What? Resources. Schedule? Resources. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Resources. 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 Okay. So I want to put resources. Now, how do we determine resources? Based on the scope. Based on the skill sets we have available, right? If we know that that's going to take an engineer, then we want to look at the engineering workforce and see what we have, okay? Now, the variable here, and it impacts your project, is we have levels of engineers in terms of their, pay, their, their performance, right? So we've got, if I pick one as the center and I got a senior level that's 1.1 and a junior level that's 0.9, then I can factor in that productivity rate. And so when he says eight hours, fact, let me show you what I can do. If I can take, if somebody says eight hours to me, okay? That's eight hours. I say, hey, Bob, the engineer, how long does it take you to do that work? And Bob says eight hours. Okay, is that what I put in the, in the plan? Who said no? What, what, why not? So he, he may not be he may not be 100 percent problem. If he's 100 percent productive, is eight eight the right number? If he's 100 percent. Pardon? 100 percent. Yeah. Well, no, I haven't got there yet. If he's 100 percent productive, is eight the right number? Yeah, of course it is. If he's on a relative scale, he's 100% productive, and he thinks it's eight hours of effort, then that's what I put in the plan, okay? Well, here's the bad news. You're wrong. 90% of the projects that I do consulting on, that I do analysis on, 90% of the projects start behind schedule. They haven't even started yet, and they're behind schedule. And they're behind schedule because of this. 
because I can take this eight hours, and even if I give them 100% productivity, which is questionable, whoops, sorry about that, uh, I've still got to divide that by what? Availability. Availability. So, I mean, we put down, guess what? If I looked at Bob's work, work plan, he's 100% committed to four projects. Now, I, don't, I just don't think he can do that. And so what we have to understand is, if he's working on three other projects in addition to this project, then what's his availability rate? 25%. 25%. Okay, so now how long should be in the plan? 32 hours. 30, 32 hours, are you crazy? We can't afford 32 hours. Then give me the right resource. Because this is called an intellectual conversation. When you go in and say, look, we're, we're already behind schedule, we haven't even started yet, why? Then you're gonna explain why. And if they say, well, that's too bad, that's the way it's gonna be, that's okay, you wanna file that away for later. Uh, because you'll have to remind them why we slip schedule. And, and then we call that a learning curve. So then maybe next time you go to him, he'll say, oh yeah, you're right, Lee. You're, you're right, we should take that into account. So this is where we do that. Okay, so we've got, we got uh, resources, then we've got uh, risk. Every work package has risk. Every work package has risks, okay? So if you don't do that exercise, you're going to have a risk hit you up blindside and it's going to screw your whole project up. Now, if this is on the critical path, if that work package has to be on a critical path, you can't afford any slip without impacting the end date. So, I mean, if you want to look smart and you want to look good, then you use the tools that we have. Don't go looking for new ones. Use the ones that we have. So we got risk, we got uh, uh, predecessors, we got successors. What else goes in there? Say again. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Cost. Quality. Quality. Okay. So now, if you see this, without going through the the list, gets really long. Subcontracts. Uh, it gets really long. But if I look at this, and then I say to myself, well, you know, there's going to have to be some further analysis here. I'm going to have to look at what are we going to do to measure quality. I look at the content, what's the scope, what are we gonna do to measure quality, gotta have all that in the plan, okay? What are we gonna do to define risk? This is the fun one. This, I used to say risk was the hottest thing going, it was the, it was the next field that I would have gotten into, N not any longer. The next field, and despite what uh, Jan said, uh, I think he got the certain magazine that told the story, well, I'm kinda guilty of so what we all do. Uh, but I think that the next big field is change management. I think that's the next big opportunity for somebody to make a splash because change management can save amazing amounts of money and trouble for an organization if you know how to do it, if you do it well, okay? So all I'm gonna say is if I look at all this and, and we look at it, we say, well, you know, that's uh, the risk. Now that risk model, I, I think this is something we really have to pay attention to because not only does the resource allocation throw us into trouble, but if we don't pay attention to risk, that throws us into trouble, okay? So we got the model, how many, how many were PMP, PMPs again, raise your hand, just real quick. Okay, yeah, that makes me sick. No, I'm just kidding. All right, so if we look at the risk, let's take a look real quick at this risk model. We've got the, uh, the uh, item of, of risk, okay? We've got, the, uh, we've got the probability, and we've got the impact, okay? So we've got those three categories. So every work breakdown structure component should go through that risk assessment. And if, and if you know, you go like, oh, we've done this a thousand times, we don't have any risk, okay, then fly by that. But do it in terms of what's, a, what's the risk event, okay? Uh, what's the probability that it's gonna occur? Where's that data come from? Historical. Comes from big data. It comes from historical information. It's like if, it's when my wife was driving, if she got lost three times and asked me to let her drive the fourth time, what do you think I'm thinking? <laughs> Get a driver, will you? Because you're never gonna find this place. So you, you based on historical information, so you begin to get look like you really understand the process. So, so we look at the event, uh, we look at the probability, and then we look at the impact. 
we look at the impact. Now, I can say, how much time do I have? Because I don't, I don't got, I got to tomorrow, right? <laughs> here's, a, here's a story for you. There, everything, everything I've learned, I've learned in stories. Uh, my daughter, uh, so I want to tell a story. Oh, my son, let's go to my son. Uh, my son is, uh, he's 50, he's 52, okay? That makes me six when he was born. Uh, and he's 52. Uh, and he, uh, he went to Denison with small liberal arts college, very expensive, drug capital of the world. Uh, and he, he went there, as long as my younger daughter, who speaks and writes Arabic and has been here many times with me. Uh, but uh, he found a girl there, you know how that works, found a girl in college. And so they decided they were gonna get married. So they came to me and they said, we need you to go talk to my mom. This is. Uh, uh, Tiffany's her name, spelled wrong. Uh, Tiffany, and she says, uh, we need you to go talk to my parents uh, about the reception. I said, what do you mean about the reception? She said, well, they, they want to have the reception outdoors. Now, this is September 11th. Well, that was a bad date in the first place. September 11th, okay? Uh, and uh, I said, well, what's wrong with that? Your parents have a beautiful spread with a little lake. And she said, yeah, but we, you can't count on the weather. They live up in Cleveland. And they said, with the lake, you don't know what you're going to get. And we don't want our wedding ruined because of the weather. So I said, okay, well, what am I going to do about that? She said, you're going to go talk to my mom and convince her that there's too much risk. I said, really? I said, Tiffany, uh, I'm not going to talk to your mom. She said, why? I said, because I know your mom. <laughs> uh, uh, I said, I, there's no way you're going to sway her opinion. She said, well, at least can you at least trust? So I did. I went up with them, got all ready, man. I had slides, zipping, dancing girls, everything. And so I get in there. They take me in their living room, which is a little bigger than this. Uh, and uh, I, I sit down, and they got everything ready for me. And I said, you ready to go? I said, yeah, let's go. So I got up. And I went through a maybe 20 minute presentation about managing the risk of weather spoiling the reception. It was darn good, I, I was proud of myself. Uh, and I got, I got all that and I thought, well how can anyone, <laughs> how can anyone go against that? And she walked up to me, Linda's her name. She walked up to me and she, she looked at the screen, she said, Lee, is this what you do for a living? <laughs> And I said, well, yeah, I guess kind of in a way it is. Why? And she said, I just can't believe it. That, that's the greatest presentation I've ever seen. She said, the slides, everything about it. She said, we're still doing it outside, but that's really a great presentation, okay? So we did it outside. We did it outside, and, and uh, they got a, uh, They said, well, what, what can we do to mitigate the risk? Remember, I'm using terms you're all familiar with. What can we do to mitigate the risk? I said, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. What do you, what do you think we did? Tent. We got a tent. And somebody said, a tent. There's 600 people coming to this wedding, okay? Thankfully, they were paying for it. And I said, uh, 600 people. And I said, well, yeah, we can get one. No, she said, not for 600 people. I said, go down to the circus. I said, they got big tents at the circus. I said, it'll hold at least 600 people. So she got called around, sure, she got a tent. So that day of the wedding, Big, huge tent, huge tent. It's about 100 degrees. Nobody went in the tent. Nobody even got near the tent. It was like an oven in there, okay? So I, I said, how much you pay for that? Six strand. I said, oh, that's a shame. I said, you really didn't have to spend all that. And so I learned that way that you got to take advantage of it. If, if people, if if I presented my case to someone else, they would have spent 6000 too. If their child's wedding, uh, was dependent upon it. So you have to weigh the, the impacts of not managing risk. And, then, and when you do that, of course, then you might get sort of into a PERT evaluation technique where depending on the risk, this is how long it'll take if it occurs, depending on, and, and th then you can start to, again, look, look like you're actually managing a project. And, and we don't spend near enough time in planning. We just, we just blow by it. We just blow by it. So there's, there's lots more we can add here, but I want you to get the point that uh, these things are, they're not just, we didn't invent all this stuff just for the fun of it. I know you have fun, but. So that's, uh, that's uh, the first one. Wow, that's the first slide, huh? Okay, well, let's see what we can do about that. 
All right, there's my work breakdown structure. I'm gonna talk, I gotta talk a little bit more about it because it's so important. You notice there that there's three components to the work breakdown structure. There's current work packages that we're working on now. Somebody's been authorized to, to spend money on them, okay? Then we've got uh, future work packages which are what we call planning packages, I don't know what you all call them, planning packages. This is, by the way, where Agile came from. Because what we found out was you can't plan a big project for its entirety, because everything's gonna change as you get close. So we said, let's just plan a little bit, and then we'll put the rest in planning. We don't get any credit for Agile. No, they go to, to, to Park City, to Snowbird, drink till they fall over, and then write a book that's uh, called The Manifesto, and they get all the credit. Well, heck, we invented this back in 96. Uh, and so it gives you that kind of input, okay? So I look at that, and I've got future, which is not well-defined at this stage of the game, okay? Uh, but the most important one, they're work packages. They're complete work packages. Packages that have been completed and have been basically signed off if you will. Now what's the value of those work packages? One of the things I want to mention is that you can't all raise your hand at once. It has to be organized. So let me ask again. Uh, what are those work packages good for? Say again? Well, they're good for budgeting. That's one of the things going to be associated with. Every time there's a change, it has a budget impact. Okay? So that's and that, that certainly is the work package. But from a standpoint of a complete work package, I'm going to go a little further to say that's your retrospective or that's your learning curve. So you look at that, and the next project that has a work package very similar to that, guess what? You're ahead of the game. Because you've got a work package that's very similar to that. You've got the hard data. This is what it really took to get that work done. So what we're doing is building... My theory has been long, for a long time is if we continue that learning curve process, at some point we'll deliver the perfect project. We will have eliminated all the unknowns and be able to go forward with a project that gets done relatively quickly. But it's up to us. I mean, nobody's going to do this for you. I mean, if you go away from here today and say, oh, that was funny, that's not what I've been trying to do. I'm trying to get you enthusiastic about using these tools. They save you tremendous amounts of uh, time and money and all the things that go along with it. So you want to be in a position to do that. Now, this is where, when Jan was talking, I thought, oh, I got a slide for that. This is called Data Mountain. And this is what he was talking about. Yes, sir. Sir, so uh, please, uh, before you proceed to the next point, uh, I always struggled with uh, when to stop the position with my WBS. Uh, you do what with it? Yeah. When to stop the decomposition? Oh, good question. That question always comes up, and I think it's a real good one. Uh, here's, here's my, it's a pretty easy answer, too. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> no, I do, I do, I do know, uh, I, and I said it early, which is kind of a, a, a chicken way out. You break it down to the point where you think you need to manage it. I think this is real important because when I first started, I mean, I don't care about that camera. When I first started doing a lot of training, I tried to go with the party line, which was break it down until it's 40 hours of effort. That's, that's what the party line said. Well, that's crap. That doesn't make sense. You break it down until it's a nice, good-sized package that you can assign resources, do all the things I said, and then you can manage the data as it comes in. This becomes your plan. Manage the data as it comes in. And that's the only reason we plan, so that we can manage. It's the only reason. So when Jan talked about decision support information, that's what he's talking about. Now, the problem that I'm talking about is if I've got automated capabilities, that's what my data pile looks like. And guess who's got to find what the heck they're looking for? You did. You did. So you've got to understand that when we've got the capability from an automated standpoint to generate a mountain of data, that's not good. You might need it for the underlying organizational component. For project management, you need very specific data, and you've got to pull it out of there. Now, if you structure the WBS correctly, it comes automatically. All the rest of the data is there. If somebody challenges you on something else, all the data is there. We're not getting rid of it. 
But you've got to understand that good becomes bad when it's overutilized. Uh, I, I, I learned this in leadership class. said anything that's your strength when it's overapplied becomes your weakness. Think about that. If your strength, here, I'll use my case just for, uh, I'm, uh, I'm fairly confident in my ability, project management wise, to share that wealth with people. I'm very, very confident. However, when I'm teaching a class, there's a, I take a risk. And what's the risk I take? These are all so important. Please store these away. The risk I take is coming across too strong, too knowledgeable, to where I'm viewed as arrogant. If they view you as arrogant, you missed the boat. I mean, I love to express my confidence, but when uh, we used to do evaluations when I worked for a bigger company, and at the end of the day, just ring through them, just threw out all the tens, and kept the ones that didn't say, well, I got one that was a six. I've never had a six in my life. I got one that was a six. And it said, it said, I'd have given you a 10 if you weren't so arrogant. See? So for her, she misread my confidence as arrogance. Now, I'm willing to take a risk once or twice, but if I started to get a plethora of those coming back saying, now this guy's way too arrogant, now I've got to change my style. So you've got to understand that that's really what you want to be in, to be in a position to understand this data but more importantly, to use it, to use it to the betterment of your project management capability. Okay? Any questions on that? I know I haven't seen your systems. I don't know, but I'll bet you you've got plenty of capability. I'll bet you can deliver data till the sun doesn't shine. Uh, but you've got to be delivering the right data. You've got to be delivering decision, support, information. Okay? Uh oh, what do I do? Oh, okay, there's, there's my Microsoft. I'm going to come back to it. Why does this not work? There. That's my Microsoft example. I, I use it all the time. By the way, Tony Scott, who allowed that to happen on his watch, left about six months after I was there. Uh, what was it said? To pursue other opportunities. Okay? So he, he paid the price of not, not knowing exactly what was going on with his people. Uh, here's the risk I did. I want to make sure that I mention this. Because in project management, if you, if you have an integrated logic network schedule, which I'm not going to show hands because it'll embarrass you, uh, we don't generally do that. I've never, I don't think I've seen more than a couple of them on projects where people actually developed an integrated logic network that gave them a critical path, okay? Which is one of the basic tools of project management. Uh, but if I had that, if I had that, then I would know that if a risk event occurs, there's, a, there's two things that can happen. One is nothing because it's not on the critical path that I've allowed for it, or it's on the critical path and my schedule just went long. Those are the two things that can happen with risk. So if you haven't well-defined risk, you're, you're gonna miss the boat on those. You're gonna miss the opportunity of not being impacted. Now the way people work now, because a lot of the plans are linear time phase plans. There's no integrative capability. They're a linear time phase. Those are nice for presentations, but they don't do anything for managing the project. And so if you've got that, you can run into some real big trouble with risks occurring that you don't really understand the impact of until it's too late, and then you can't recover. That's the big problem with risk, is you gotta, you gotta recover early. Uh, now we have dashboards, you all have, I heard somebody say they had a dashboard. Dashboards are awesome. Dashboards, I mean really. Has the dashboard salesman been here? Oh, they'll be here, they're, they're very popular, dashboards. And I don't get it, I don't understand why. I mean it's, again, a very basic concept. Uh, dashboards are supposed to warn you when things aren't going the way you thought they would, they call that a plan, uh, and then give you the opportunity to do something about it, and if you don't, they turn red so that it gets somebody's attention, okay? So they pattern it after a traffic light. You ever, you ever, I mean, most of you drive here, I'm sure. Uh, I, I, uh, I think they did. I, I think green, when it's green, what color is it? I mean, what time is it? 
Greens go. We just started the project. Hell, you can't have anything wrong yet. It's green, okay? Next time we report, what color is it? Yellow. Stuff started to go wrong. We're one month into this darn project. It's already starting to go wrong. So it's yellow, okay? Well, in traffic light, green, and yellow's caution. Got to slow down, right? Okay? So next month, what color is it? No, it's yellow. Yellow. And then the next month, what color is it? Yellow. Yeah. Yellow. It's, it stays yellow the rest of the way. Because what happens when it turns red? You get help from management. That's what happens. So nobody wants it to go red. So they go yellow, 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 yellow. And, and then now you've just defeated the entire purpose of the dashboard. Because it really makes sense. So when I, I'm, I'm a kind of a risky driver, and so I, I drive fairly fast, and, and uh, I, I'll be driving down the road, and I'll see that green light, and my wife's sitting here next to me saying, better stop, better stop, Whoosh, gun right through that baby, turn, turn yellow, Whoosh, right through that baby. She said, you just ran a yellow light. I said, no, no, that was a long yellow. That was a long yellow. Uh, and, and so that's the risk you take. See, same thing with these. That's, I can relate almost everything we have to a common sense, real life situation. And in this case, you take the risk of running the yellow. In other words, when it's yellow, you have a choice to make. And if your choice is to run it, you may, you may pay the consequence. And so we have to think about it that way. That's the way projects are. If we have the data that tells us what's gonna happen in the future, and we ignore it? Well, come on. That's, we can't do that. Okay, we can't do that. All right, the last one is I, I really want to thank you for coming. Very quiet. Uh, my my uh, programs are normally very boisterous, but I know you're a very professional group and didn't want to speak out a lot, but I thought facial expression scared me, okay? Uh, is that, is, I really want to let you know that I'm going to be here next two days, too. Uh, if you if you want to talk about any of this, happy to. Uh, I really think that you have an opportunity to really have an impact on the world that you live in from a project perspective. Okay, I really do. Now you can opt to just keep on doing the same way you've been doing. That's up to you. Or you can opt to do something that increases your uh, confidence, increases your de uh, development, increases your uh, commitment to the organization. Uh, it's your call. It's your call. I mean, I, all this training does is it makes you aware. I, I, I don't stand next to you while you're doing it. It makes you aware, and it takes work to do. I mean, it's not easy to do. That's why we don't do it. But I really want to encourage you to think about what we said. Think about the other presenters too, because it all links in right nicely with what I had to say today. It's a very nice linkage, uh, and, and it depends on how much effort you put in uh, to how much is gonna go out to add value to some of the other things we talked about. All right, any questions today for me? Now see, this is bad. This is bad. From a presenter's point of view, no questions means one of two things. One is that you're the smartest group I've ever worked with. This is the one, yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's the a, second it's one no, no, it's is that you thought my presentation sucked. <laughs> so either one, I can't, I'm not going to get any mileage out of you guys. So thank you very much, you guys. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Thank you very much.